There are billions of people on the planet and many different personality types. Some people are introverted, some extroverted. Some are driven by logic and others by their feelings. In a world of such diversity, how do we learn to relate to those who are different? And how do we learn to understand and accept who we are? People have a desire to know themselves. People want to know who am I, how do I function, how do I tick? These questions were at the heart of the pioneering work of Dr. Carl Gustav Jung, a Swiss psychologist who began working at the turn of the 20th century. Despite the conformity in dress, behavior, and attitude dictated by his time, Jung championed individuality and he invited his patients to embrace the unique person each was meant to be. Jung said, okay, that's what society tells you, that's what's expected of you, but what do you think? How do you feel? He said that we all need to get to know ourselves better and know our motives better, and if we could really look at that more, that we would be able to be more accepting um, of differences. In his own life, Carl Jung embarked on a painful journey of self-discovery, and the lessons he learned provided inspiration for generations to come. In 1909, at the age of only 34, Carl Jung had succeeded in creating the life he'd always imagined. Born the son of a poor country minister, Jung married the wealthy Emma Rauschenbach. Together they built an idyllic home and family. Jung had worked his way through medical school and had become a world-renowned psychologist in Zurich. And as the chosen heir apparent of pioneering psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, Jung was at the center of a revolution taking place in the world of psychology. That revolution was based on Freud's radical concept of the unconscious. At a time when Victorian society prided itself on being highly rational and civilized, Freud argued that people were really driven by repressed urges they weren't even aware of. Jung was one of the few who had embraced Freud's provocative ideas. The pair quickly became partners in promoting psychoanalysis around the world and slowly they were gaining the respect of the mainstream medical community. In Freud, Jung had found not only an important professional mentor, but also a father figure. His own father died when he was just 20. The death of Carl Jung's father ended any money coming into the household. And it was up to him then, he was the only son, it was up to him to take care of both his mother and his sister. And so, keep in mind, uh, Jung was sort of an orphan. He looked for a guy, the father, uh, you, you understand? And he found that in Freud. Jung's future seemed secure, but there was just one problem. Jung had nagging doubts about some of his mentor's theories. For, for Jung, Freud was too close, too narrow. Jung, Jung was very open. He, nothing, you know, he closed his eyes to nothing. Jung spoke about Freud in a 1959 interview. I liked him very much, but I soon discovered that when he had thought something, then it was settled, while I was doubting all along the line. Freud's theories on the sex drive were particularly troubling to Jung. While Freud believed that sexual urges were the sole driving force behind human behavior, Jung believed that we are influenced by many other factors, like religious beliefs, the need for approval, and the drive for power. Freud said, in effect, no, it's sex or nothing. And Jung said, I can't accept this theory wholeheartedly. And this is really what um, caused the rupture between them. Things came to a head in 1913, when Jung published a book which directly contradicted Freud's theories. Unwilling to tolerate dissension in his ranks, Freud cut all ties to his former protege. 
Jung's mentor now became his most outspoken critic. Carl Jung was ostracized from the psychoanalytic movement he'd helped to establish. It was a big blow to Jung. He, he went through a period of disorientation and a period where he wasn't really sure whether he, he had lost his sanity or not. Though the, the separation was in the coming, it threw uh, Jung into a deep depression, which, however, was beneficial. Um, it was liberating. He had to go on his own. The son has to do his own thing. Ultimately, Jung would go on to do his own thing, but the years ahead would be difficult. Just months after Jung's own life had been shattered, the fabric of Victorian society was also torn apart. As World War I exploded across Europe, Jung retreated to his house on Lake Zurich to fight his own internal battle. He went down to the beach in front of his house and played in the, with the pebbles and sand, and he said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but this is the only thing right now that will relieve the anxiety and the disturbance that I'm feeling. From there, he went into what he calls the confrontation with the unconscious. Desperate to find his way, personally and professionally, Jung began a process of deep self-analysis. He spent hours alone recording his thoughts, analyzing his dreams, and making elaborate drawings as a way to express the deepest parts of his unconscious. Jung used this period to think about what he was going to do with his life. He said to himself, I can't continue to practice psychoanalysis if I use Freud's terms and Freud's methods. I have to create a system of my own. As he probed deeper and deeper into his own psyche, Jung became increasingly convinced that his unconscious was driven by more than just sexual urges, repressed thoughts, and memories. There was another influential force that Freud had overlooked. The history of civilization. Jung had studied many of the world's cultures and religions, and he observed that even the most dissimilar share common ideas and behavior patterns. He found, for example, that Native American Indians had certain stories and rituals in common with tribes in Africa and other cultures throughout the world. And he said, these things are in common. And these people don't know anything about each other. They have no way to communicate with each other. How is it, why is it, that they are all telling a very similar, if not the exact same, version of this same story? Jung concluded that the unconscious is influenced not only by our own experiences, but by the collective experiences of all people. These common ideas are passed down through history, religion, and culture. He called this wealth of inherited knowledge the collective unconscious. It is this collective unconscious that leads human beings around the world to adopt similar behavior patterns without even realizing it. Every culture has certain classical, typical behavior uh, modalities, like the hero. You can go from east to west, north to south, you can recognize a hero, you can recognize a soldier, you can recognize a healer. Or the father as the great good figure who dispenses all knowledge and all wisdom, an unforgiving, disapproving mother. These are universal behavior patterns. They just appear in different clothing at different times. 